Lucas, are you there? Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so my name is Giselle and this panel is entitled uh, Transnationalism, uh, Transculturality. Thank you. <laughs> so again, my name is Giselle and uh, welcome all. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this panel is called Transnationalism, Transculturality and Translation. And I have with, uh, we have with us so Juliana and Isabella who are following my talk. Um, actually the order is, is first Isabella and then Juliana and uh, we still have the hope Vittoria joins us soon. So the title of my talk is uh, Cultural Translation into Worlds, Ireland and Japan. And this paper, uh, let me try the slide. So, <laughs> um, okay. Can you all see my slide? Yeah. Yes, and yes. Can, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, again, the title of my talk is Cultural Translation into Worlds, Ireland and Japan. And this paper is an initial reading of the project developed at the William Butler Yeats Chair of Irish Studies in Brazil, named Transculturality and Poetry Images Impermanences, um, which in itself is a continuation of the project Transculturality and Poetry, Brazil, Ireland and Japan, a partnership between the Fluminense Federal University and the Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. And its aim is to study the impermanence, the transitoriness is a highly relevant concept of and to Japanese culture and its representations and reverberations in Ireland today. We take into account the influence of Japanese culture in the works of Irish poets, mainly from the second half of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st. While talking about the relations between Ireland and Japan, we inevitably report on the writer William Butler Yeats and the universe of the English language once Yeats had much interest in the No traditions and as such the connections he established between the No and his own dramatic principles resulted in substantial changes in the general conception of his plays. His frequent trips to the US as a lecturer and in diverse universities along 1904, 1911, 1920, 1932. Giselle, Giselle yeah. could you yes. put the presentation um, bigger because it's showing everything? Um, you mean bigger? Like in presentation mode, sorry about that. I'm not sure if I know how to do that. To the bottom, you have like a screen a small thing to the bottom of the um, PPT. No, to the bottom, bottom. There, no. Na partezinha de baixo, Gisele, você vai ver, é, tem aonde você consegue aumentar a apresentação, tá em 76%. Do lado, tem, tá vendo que tem um bannerzinho do lado? Bem embaixo, do lado da... Aí, aqui, ó, isso. Aperta o bannerzinho. Não. Tá vendo que tem anotações, comentários? Aí tem Sim. quatro... Então, nesse ícone que parece um banner num tripé... Sim. Tá vendo? Isso, aperta Sim. ali. Mas assim fica muito grande, não? Não, não. Do lado dessa parte, que é a régua, tem um é. outro... Esse outro, do lado desse. Ah. Do lado... É, acho que deu. Acho que tá bom. <laughs> Desculpa. Okay, thank you. Obrigada. So going back here, uh, talking about the influence of Yeats and his uh, traveling, his frequent traveling to the U.S. Uh, brought him many influences from the president of the U.S. to various personalities of the arts and culture. And these contacts have led him to the proficuous dialogue between East and West uh, that we read in his works. Uh, these contacts, uh, so then um, a central name in charge of such exchange has been Ernest Francisco Penalosa, born in 1853 and died in 1908. Uh, professor of the Tokyo Imperial University where he studied old temples, sanctuaries, uh, objects of art, um, important educator during the modernization of the Meiji era 
Chenolaza has been an enthusiastic Orientalism that has much contributed to the preservation of traditional Japanese art. After his death, his writings about Chinese art and the No were passed on to Ezra Pound, who together with Yates has made use of his notes to solidify the growing interest on Oriental literature amongst modernist writers. Later, Pound concluded the task of editing Penelosa's work with the help of Arthur Whaley. Yet we can characterize the first Irish generation of poets who turned to the East and whose leader has been Yeats as that who goes beyond the old theater and the modernist prose responses to it as attested in also uh, poetic lines such as in this poem uh, written in 1938, published in 1938, imitated from the Japanese. A most astonishing thing, 70 years have I lived, hooray for the flowers of spring, for spring is here again. 70 years have I lived, no ragged, no ragged beggar man, 70 years have I lived, 70 years man and boy, and never have I danced for joy. Another initial and highly relevant writer to the relationship between East and West has been Oscar Wilde, whose narrative in prose in the end of the 19th century alluded to all that was visually new and yet unknown um, Orient, the yet unknown Orient, which had become the exotic source of his writing. Irene De Angelis, author of The Japanese Effect in Contemporary Irish Poetry, in 2000, uh, published in 2012, and Our Shared Japan, 2007, affirms that thinking about the relationship Japan-Ireland means going back to the images of which Ezra Pound was part, along with impressionists and symbolists, a group of painters of which William Butler Yeats' own brother, John Yeats, known as Jack B. Yeats, was part. It is worth remembering uh, that the cause for Japan to be shut down to the world for 200 years was connected to the fear of Christian colonization, and that according to the Angelis, the exception uh, from the 17th to the 19th centuries uh, had been the Dutch population whom as Protestants have not shown the crucifix as a symbol of Jesuit, Jesuit colonialism, thus adopting a policy of religious tolerance. The Irish twist of the Christian persecution has been an endless search for Zen Buddhism, or at least just Buddhism. In the understanding of the Japanese isolationism, scholars reinforce the need to look into Japanism as part of the gradually growing opening of Japan to the, to the West since the Great Exhibition of London in 1862 and of the Paris Exhibition in 1867. Obviously, the work of Yeats and Wilde have been a consequence of such movement. The London exhibit brought belongings of an English ministry called Rutherford Alcock, whose book the following year, 1863, The Capital of Tycoon, a narrative of a three years residence in Japan, praises the Japanese by saying that he had, and I quote, no hesitation in admitting that they were just rivals of the best products in Europe, but that they also produced crafts in all departments uh, that they were um, uh, to which we cannot equal, end of quote. This illustration, let me find the illustration here, okay. This illustration is found in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And uh, we have to say that in the mapping of the Irish poets who translate Japan in their works, we start with the founding poets, so to speak, um, of an end of 19th century aesthetics and which goes beyond the dialogic one because it recreates, retranslates, reconfigures Japan to the West. Relevant to notice um, that France and England at the same time would start the literary translations of the East, in particular of Japan, and this will be the base for the following second and third generation of Irish poets under the Japanese effect whose use of the term comes from Shimizhini. Um, uh, while, um, so he, he uses it while reading poetically in Dublin in the year 2000. Uh, on the occasion, while reading Paddles on Sandy Mount Strand, he talks about the Japanese effect in Irish poetry, which will reappear in the 2007 anthology, Our Shared Japan which gathers 85 poets influenced by Japan and its multiple artistic forms. Some of these poets have lived or visited Japan, 
uh, for lecturing, readings, or personal replies to the exposure they had had to cultural Japanese forms, mainly translations into English of haiku. Uh, these poets' poetic replies provide readers with some of the most redundant symbols of Japan, bonsai trees, cherry blossoms, the Fuji mountain, geishas, haiku, hokusai impressions, kabuki, kimono, dano, origami, sake, samurai, sushi, the tea ceremony, and the zen. But they also go beyond all this. Moreover, their replies do not monopolize the influence of the post-war moment in Japan into the English language. Quite the contrary. There are unusual readings and dialogues with poets such as Gary Knight, Snyder, uh, Robert Haas in the US, and Anthony Twight and Peter Robinson in the UK. So uh, the Ireland-Japan bond has long overpassed the ancient Irish poetry and the haiku, reaching the strong Japanese interest for Irish literature, uh, and most recently emphasized by the academic links uh, between universities, which assured that Irish men and women reached Japan in order to teach the English language, which is the case of many Irish poets of the third generation we have been referring to in our research. Nathan Sitzma in 2020, categorizes two groups of Irish poets writing about Japan. The first would be those of established reputation that tend to visit Japan mediated most strongly by a previous exposure to Japanese aesthetic forms. And the second group, those of younger poets who have built their reputation as they made a living in Japan as English teachers in general. Thus following our own generational classification of poets who transculturalized Japan and who have initiated with Yates uh, we identify a second generation of poets who form a group with uh, Derek Mahan, um, Michael Lonely, Karen Carson, Thomas Kinsella, amongst others. So let us quote from Michael Lonely, whose book, The Weather in Japan, emphasizes the negotiation of the trauma experiences, spiritual dislocation and foreignness while traveling around places that go from the west coast of Ireland to passages in Italy and in the US to reach Japan, where finally a home and a civilization are found going beyond geographical limits or transculturalization them, as we can read in the approaching of universal themes, such as the passage of time and aging. So here's uh, one poem, No Water, a fastidious brewer of tea, a tea connoisseur as well as a poet, I modestly request on my 60th birthday a gift of snow water. Tea, steam, and ink stains single-mindedly. I scald my teapot and measure out some silver needles tea. Enough for a second steeping. Other favorites include clear distance and eyebrows of longevity or from the precarious mountain peaks. Cloud mist tea, quite delectable, which com competent monkeys harvest filling their baskets with choice leaves and bringing them down to where I wait with my cropped snow water. This poem is an intro text with the famous Snow Party, which is a well-known one written by Shimizhini, inspired by Basho's travel writing. And that takes the poet of the second generation, Derek Mahon, to speculate on failure and regret. So here's the poem, Leaves. Somewhere there is an afterlife of dead leaves, a stadium filled with an infinite rustling and sign. Somewhere in the heaven of lost futures, the lives we might have had, the, my, the lives we might have led, sorry, have found their own fulfillment. Both poems, Snow Water and Leaves, in spite of not following the common association between Japan and their stereotypified signs, allude to thematic images of impermanence, life after death, the celestial movement of futures to which we have no access, and the life we have had in ceaseless and transitory searches, as well as in permanent transitions. According to Sitzma, only the younger generation of poets, uh, which in our categorizing is the third generation of Irish poets that culturally translate Japan, will disconnect from the haiku and the woodblock woodblock prints, allowing for some dislocation and estrangement that are the basis for the experience of negotiation with the concrete images that are those secretive images upon and beyond the skyscrapers, such as in the poem, The Rising Sun by Karen Carson, um, whose lyric eye dimensions human illusion. 
as I was driven into smoky Tokyo, the yen declined again. It had been going down all day against the bullion Hibernian pound. Black rain descended like a heart arpeggio. The professor took me to a bonsai garden to imbibe some thimble tools of Japanese poutine. poutine. We wandered through the forests of books of Arden. The number of their syllables was 17. I met a maiden from Hiroshima who played the hammer, dulcimer, like psychedelic rain. The rising sun was hid behind a cloud of jade. She sang to me of Fujiyama and of Zen, of yin and yang and politics and crack cocaine, Plato's caverns, which are measureless to man. Still, about this second generation of poets, we also notice that Pomodou anachronistically reappropriates the short form as if adapting the haiku, and I forgot just to send this one to my slides, so I'll just read. A small hard pair falls and hits the deck with a thud. Rightness is not all. Uh, the most celebrated Irish poet in Japan, Shimuzhini, has visited the country three times, 1990, on the occasion of the ISC conference there, in 2098, and in 2000, uh, 1998, sorry, <laughs> and in 2000, when he offered a series of lectures that were known as the Lafcadio Hearn and were published in the Gendaishi Teshu Journal. Um, and the generation of poets um, at the end of the 20th century that gained visibility in the first decade of the 21st, namely particularly Shinid Morrissey, author of several books of poems of which we highlight between here and there, 2002, Through the Square Window, 2009, and The State of Prisons, 2005. Between here and there has an entire passage called Japan and various poems that picture the poet's life transmigrated into the lyric eyes voice. And I quote, between here and there, no one seems sure of the reason why aprons are tied to the necks of stone babies in temples. The priest says, Hunter, the guide to Kyoto City mentions cold on their journey away from us to the heaven for children. I look at them spotting Buddha reflection wrapped up to the throat in, a, in teddy bears and trains. Are these images of a trembling world as pointed out by John Milton as he talks about uh, Japan as a trembling world um, and Tokyo in particular? Morrissey draws from a globalized world that contains memorable local specificities in the distribution of diverse languages. In this sense, we are led to work uh, to the work by Hini's partner with the Angelis in the edition of Our Shared Japan, the poet Joseph Woods in Sailing to Hokkaido, which is really, um, uh, anyway, here's the poem in the slide. Um, Sailing to Hokkaido. After dinner, walk to the stern alone and look out for the time it takes to the sun to darkness from one. Sui Hasen was the line where the sky and the sea met, where two horizons, sky and sea, land and sky, there are two words. Tonight, one darkness overruns another. There's no line between the two. Walk back to the palpable heartbeat of a generator. So after this poem, we, we can get the sense of the matter of transculturality becoming impermanent itself and enabling us to play with the term in permanence, which can be a threat to both art, poetry, and the history of Japanese art, especially when transcultured to the West. And I stop here. Thank you. And here's um, um, the moment in which I pass the word to Isabella. Yes, yeah, Isabella Mengis. So let me introduce Isabella is here among us. Um, Isabella is a, was an English major at the University of Sao Paulo, where she became interested in the field of Irish literature. She's currently an MA student in English and American Department at the University of Lisboa, where she's currently finishing her dissertation on postcolonial Irish American literature. So her research focuses on the intersections between the city and identity, particularly in, as regards Colin McCann's lack of great world spin. So Isabella, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And um, hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Let me just share my presentation. Okay, and 
let me put this in presentation mode but just one second okay so hello my name is isabella this semester i'm finishing my master's degree at the university of, Lis uh, of lisboa and i will be presenting part uh, of my first chapter it was very hard to uh, put it under 20 minutes but let's try um some of uh, some of you might already know Carlos McCann's work. He is the author of several praised books, born in Dublin and currently living in the United States. He incorporates both American and Irish influences with very insightful perspectives on multicultural communities. Uh, as you can see, he has uh, won several awards, including an Oscar nomination for a short uh, a short uh, movie. The novel we'll be talking about is Let the Great World Spin, published in 2009. It centers around multiple perspectives around August, um, August 7th, 1974, the day that Petit, uh, Philippe Petit crossed the Twin Towers on a high wire hope. The book offers different stories in perspective about the crossing, while traveling 27 years uh, to the future and going to a post 9-11 scenario. Petit takes, uh, walks, takes a symbolic turn throughout the novel associated with metaphors of crossing, overcoming and resilience. And an important uh, element for us would be the picture that is placed in the middle of the book. Today, I would, uh, I would like to make the point of how McCann links the photograph with the first part of the book that we can call preface. The narration transforms the city of New York into an observer of Petit's performance. More and more pe uh, people gather to observe the artist and we see the following quote. Uh, and then a torrent of chatter was released, a call and response. And it seems to ripple all the way through, all the way from the wind still down to the sidewalk and allow the cracks pavement uh, to the corner of Fruton down the block along Broadway, where it zigzagged down John, hooked around the Sal and Anton, a domino line of laughter, but with an edge to it, a longing away. Um, and many of the watchers realize with a shiver that no matter what they said, they really wanted to witness a great fall, see someone war arc downwards all the distance to disappear from the sideline, flail, smash to the ground, and give the Wednesday electricity and meaning that all they need to become a family was one millisecond of sleep ledge. In this moment of the text, we are able to envision two movements. First, the Subdo continue between the people in the city. The narration indicates the rise of conversation among the observers. He starts connecting the windows, the buildings, going down to the pavement and those on the street, skillfully infusing the city map as an equivalent for the crowd. Relying on street names and such, the narrator correlates the names of the streets to its people sandwiching um, New York's physical descriptions between chit chatter and the domino of ladder as their reactions follow an automatic and natural succession. The individuality of each pedestrian, it's not erased in face of their numbers. Instead, together, they wish and desire to become a family. The masses are in constant movement, their experience symbolic of the urban, uh, urban tensions. The author stylistic, stylistic choices enhancing this connection between city and people, and the text before uh, transform each person into a part of the urban ecosystem. And as Susana Araujo uh, points out in his, in her book *Transatlantic Depictions of 9/11 and the War on Terror*, this language of unification is not new to theorists of urban space. The use of space in general and of urban space and public, moment, public, public, public monuments in particular has always played an important political role in either endorsing or fabricating feelings of social cohesion. 
Both photo and text rely on the perspective that comes from beneath, a point of view which looking up from the ground um, uh, looks down upwards. The preface takes place uh, at this moment of rupture, the confusion and the eagerness to give meaning to it, to create a narrative around it, and to enable connection with the other, to create cohesion, uh, even, if, even if through tragedy. The recreation of this moment complements the perspective of the photograph in many ways. Their link helps to further resignify the picture through narrated times. When the narrative highlights the possibility for connection uh, with another through the character's experience, the narrative unfolds on different levels. First, we observe the individual experience and its relationship with the other and their desire to become a family. And secondly, more so, subtle uh, is the macro picture of history, bringing forward the infer parallel between the war in Vietnam, the Iraq wars, and even the troubles at, uh, at, uh, in an Irish context. Uh, and challenging the political role attributed to this uh, image of the war. If we go to regarding the pain of others, uh, Sentag expresses how knowledge uh, acknowledge the beauty of photographs of the World Trade Center ruins the, mo uh, the uh, of the World Trade Center's ruins at the months following the attack seem frivolous, sacrilegious. The most people dare to say was the photographs were surreal, erratic, euphemism behind which uh, the disgraced notion of beauty cowered. Several authors attempt to use shocking pictures to expose the American treatment of others in warfare, while the media usually use the 9-11 images to arouse a sense of patriotism uh, with the reader both fed on the impact of gra graphic photographs. The goal was to shock the public. The In Let the Grove Spin, though, uh, the photo use is not quite so strong. There is a symbolism and parallels to it, but it's far less provoking. The photo just as the novel becomes a bridge between two times and spaces. The photo inspire possibilities and confront discourses uh, built around the event. Account, uh, accounting for what for which is gone, the photo has the potential to give a fresh breath to something that is no longer that no longer exists. The fiction alone uh, has the power. If fiction alone has the power to create new possibilities, to see and combine, uh, to see things from different perspectives with uh, the time distance between the narrated time and the actual time of publication. Combined with the photo, uh, it enables us to, uh, to explore the latent potentiality of the image. Looking at the photo of the past, we are transported, um, we transport it to the present. It's a constant resignification. The text is a representation of this untouchable reality and a reimagination uh, re that expands our understanding uh, of being frozen in a tragic event. Time is suspended within the frames. The reader is transported to the past uh, in the narrative while simultaneously the photo is transported to the present. In the narrative, as much as in the picture, the fall is a ghost. The repercussion of traumatic conflicts goes beyond what is written or shown. The reenactment of a crystallized moment evidences the way the author performs grief in his fiction. The historical time comes forward as a pivot moment. The reflection of our times in the photo, the reminiscence at the, in the before. The Tower's Fall is one of the main events that precipitated the war on terror. The choice to use an image of an standing tower before the tragedy is very, very significant. The book acknowledges and describes the photo uh, in the last chapter uh, as a man in the air while a plane disappears. It seems into the edge of the building, one small scrap of history meeting a larger one, 
as if the walking men were somehow anticipating what would come later, the intrusion of, of time and history, the collision point of stories. We wait for the explosion, but it never occurs. The plane passes, the tightrope walker gets to the end of the wire. Things don't fall apart. Embodying the expression of time through static image, the, uh, the Lucas photograph might present a dreadful sense of deja vu. The image of the World Trade Center still standing with a man in the middle, almost flying, could evoke contradictory feelings to those uh, socially fabricated with, uh, in front of the 9-11. The myriad of feelings associated with the subject is triggering. Uh, however, let the great word spin has a different aim from the usual photos associated, uh, associated with the band. Petit does not fall Contrary to many of the washers' sentient uh, wishes, he stands tall in the, meeting, in the middle of the building, balancing in an iron line, way spiring. Like Petit, the reader is led uh, by the novel through the crossing, the physical crossing of the book from cover to cover, the time crossing of 27 years uh, in narrated time, and also the crossing that uh, begins with the first chapter where we have an Irishman going to American and also with the American girl going back to Ireland to find uh, her in search for her roots. The insection in of past and present, past and present, the space changes, the photo becomes an evidence of something that it's no longer there. We approach uh, the Lucas photograph with post 9-11 eyes and we are able to resignify the details as much as the narrator of the last chapter does when she looks at it. The airplane, the main between the towers, fictionalizing the collective experience while displaying evidence of, what, of the moment, enhancing the tensions of what is perceived as factual uh, by the reader. The photo serves as an evidence of a fictional viewpoint. The, the scene shifts as it resurfaces new meanings. The photograph helps us understand the aspect of our own time by looking back and observing the past through new, lens new lenses. The photo and the preface put us in the washer shoes to give a new understanding of a frozen moment. They expand our vision on present issues. McCann further complicates our understanding of these events questioning the uses of image and collective feeling evoked by them, focus on the performative quality of the photo. One way to conclude this presentation might be reinforcing the knowledge that to understand the present, one must look back, put on the shoes of another time and challenge the tragic perspectives we are usually fed in events that are uh, very uh, near to us. The proximity of contemporary events could cloud our vision, the manipulated of strong images of, uh, of suffering used to bring us together. But by looking differently at one moment, we might find that is um, what is still remain of hope. And in the fact that things don't fall apart, that even after fall, even after traumatic events, we remain. Um, as does uh, this beautiful novel. Um, and here are some of the references I used in the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabella, and thank you very much for being so precise with time. I was trying. <laughs> After all presentations, I'm sure we all have, uh, at least I do, I have many, many questions to, to so, with which we can start our conversation. But for the time being, let me pass on over to Juliana. Uh, Juliana de Grazia Costa uh, is uh, an MA uh, in the program of aesthetics and art history at Maki USPI. And she uh, is part of the Department of Art Direction in projects, audiovisual projects in fiction. She has been uh, part of this uh, department for the last 20 years and she teaches. Um, Decoração de cena. Uh, I'm wondering how we could translate that into English. That decorator. Yeah. That decorator. Yeah. Okay, thank you. In uh, postgraduate course in Senaki. 
send her the title of her presentation is a Diário de William Joseph O'Neill Dunt, uh, Visualidades do Corpo Reflexivo. So thank you, Juliana, you have the floor. Thank you, Giselle. Um, hi, good morning for all of you. Um, hold on here, I will take my presentation. Um, can you see it? No? Now? Not yet. yet. Uh, yeah, 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 no. Okay. Uh, so, um, first of all, I'd like to, to thank to the organization committee uh, of the Symposium of Irish Studies in South America and to the National Library of Ireland that allowed me to show some pages of the Downs Journal. Um, here, um, I have had translated a journals of William Joseph O'Neill Downs, Reflexive Body Visuals. So uh, as Giselle was saying, uh, I will introduce myself just a little bit. <laughs> uh, my name is Juliana de Grazia. I work as a set decorator on the Brazilian film industry. And currently I am a master's student of aesthetic and art history in the University of Sao Paulo transdisciplinary postgraduate program. And the research developed through my master's project dedicated its remarks to the visual aesthetic presented in a self-biographic text written through 46 years on the second half of the 19th century by an Irish man. I bring to this symposium a number of thoughts on the sensitive being in constant porous relation with the world through an Irish body that for Maurice Merleau-Ponty is what he calls reflexive body. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, my research has a philosophical reflections, which is a little bit complex, uh, but far away to be boring. Actually, for me, it's very exciting. I hope you enjoy it. And so in 2013, I visited the ancestors' land in Ireland and obtained knowledge of the existence of a journal elaborated by an ancestor first cousin of Richard Gilberton Down, Irish man who arrived in Brazil on the first half of the 19th century and, and is part of my paternal lineage. Returning to Ireland in two. 2016, I was able to dedicate to the manuscript reading of William Joseph O'Neill Down's journal pages. The experience of reading throughout five months inspired me to discuss somehow with the author landscape world vision. Let me introduce you uh, the writer that by reporting ordinary events delivers a sensitive vision on the world he lives. Okay. Okay, um, William Joseph O'Neill Downs was born a Protestant on uh, April 28, 1807 in Tullamore, Kings County, south of Ireland. After his father passed, he formally converted to Catholicism and performed fiercely in the religious politic field. His prima, pri primary focus was to institute a parliament in Ireland to provide an independence from England in legal decisions concerning domestic affairs. Daunt ran his time in Irish history timeline as a rights to religious, politics, and social beliefs activists for the space that the Irish Catholics occupied before the English domain. Party to the progressivism's idea of Daniel O'Connell, Daunt takes active participation on the foundation of the Loyal National Repeal Association in 1841, and is invited by O'Connell to take the opening as his first secretary despite his constant political action, Daunt was also a writer. He authored novels considered Victorian under the alias of Denis Ignatius Moriarty, and as a writer taking his own name throughout his entire life, he published articles in newspapers and various books of on history, historic, politic, religious topics. Despite his literary production, as well as all his political movement, my object of study is the writing of the author's reflexive body through the journal pages. 
The material belongs to the manuscripts area in the National Library of Ireland and is composed of 1,428 handwritten pages and divided in three volumes. The fragment of my studies consists on the first pages on the first volume, precisely a politic religious journey performed by the author on behalf of the Repeal Association. Down started his journal on September 12th, 1842, while engaging the chair of Daniel O'Connell's first secretary. For a few weeks, the author went through parts of Ireland's countryside. He started in this trip an ordinary account, which might be firstly an archive for information reports on the politic advances and mishaps faced during that crossing. Nonetheless, a fondness for the inherent language from sensitive experience uh, woven by uh, his vision is noticeable. The author did not dodge from his sensitive and suit or ordinary new on the advances on, of the politic enterprises which a language that highlights the memory of childhood experience as well as his perceptions and thoughts concerning the things in the world which were around him. Um, find a way to see poetic aspect on the author's seer. I researched method movements, re reaching the possibility to access a sensitive contact point. The handwritten journal as object and image emerging to the reader from the language, making it possible to see the recollections of the landscape site, I support myself in instigating concepts by the phenomenologist philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty. For the philosopher, there is a field prior to the thought that the intellectualism does not reach. The word is there before we think about it. Towards reflecting the things in the world, we should admit a pre-reflexive genesis. We ought to accept in the compound of our reflections the presence of a primordial origin enigma on things. In such a way, there is something invisible consisting what we see and research. For Merleau-Ponty, the subject perceives the world from a body on a mutual crossing relationship. Something real is created from the subject and not something unattached to him. The subject is embodied in the world crossing and being crossed by such a world. And this world is surrounding such a body and not surrounded by them. In such a way, it is not possible to see every field. There, there will always be an invisible, which is consisting part of the being, the subject, just as the ground world will always contain something that the eyes do not reach. It is after the perceptive and relational being with the world that the thought about the world is conceived and such thought is also scattered with relation experience. With relation experience. Um, Merleau-Ponty understand that the language conveyed through literature is authentic and sensitive expression, product from inner repercussion, which is triggered by bodily and later visual world perception from the being in the world. There is an action of the world in such relation. This world offer, offers itself to the author, sprouts in it. What overflows from the sensitive relation between the subject, uh, the being, and the world overflows as aesthetic, aesthetic and cultural production. Constituting part of, of a composed material which belongs to humanity in the temporality of their existence, which means for the philosopher, Dante's journal could be considered expressive materialization that unveils an aspect from that starting instant of the initiation of the being, where the subject through visible and sensitive points of contact between oneself and the world put, puts oneself in a dialectical and productive action of matter and visuality. Okay. Um, let me read this sentence. Uh, it is from this law before me that I think, oh, hold on, I 
that I think I catch sight of the impact of the green on the vision of another. It is through the mu music that I enter into his musical emotion. It is the thing itself that opens unto me the access to the private world of another. Maurice Merleau-Ponty. There is a contact between the presence of the world and the presence of the being in the world. It's here and visible components in temporality. The body world I understand to be the whole of natural material as well as that produced by the body of the being as a cultural component. As follows, I believe Down's journal uh, to be a body within the body world. This journal body is product of the creating action which only exists through the relation between the author and the landscape world which surrounds him. The journal is a body which carries a language which comes from a vision in the world. Okay. After such phenomenological path, it's possible to realize new language layers in the journal. There is, ev there is evidence on a perception of a body in the world. Then, through improbable movements as an art researcher, I open a new perspective of the vision concerning the absorption of the landscape world to such path. Approach the aesthetic of the author through the meeting between both body perceptions in the world travel, the author and the researcher. Inspired by such reflections, I realized that I have created additional layers of time and space by putting myself in crossing the world of the path in the trip that Daunt made. Putting my body and my vision in the landscape world that crossed him in September 1842 would be to create a new contact point with the object of study which means I established a bodily approach to the research creating an anachronistic experience of reflexive bodies, doubt and the researcher, crossing the same space. Therefore, adding the bodies of the researcher and the journal author in the composing of the research path might open new logic opportunity. And here, uh, I mean that I decided to follow his steps and his eyes and body in the political journey. So I bought a map and started to create a path followed by car to follow by car. The experience was filmed in a documental manner, reaching for something bodily and visual seen and felt by doubt. I performed a filming that consisted of two points of view, my subjective vision reaching the author's vision and my experience registered by the vision of the Brazilian photographer resident in Dublin, Mika More. I put this, um, okay, um, well, uh, here we are at the old abbey, um, old, old abbey of Muti Farham and the writer wrote, September 26, uh, the bishop brought me to see the old uh, abbey of Muti Farham. Part of it is ruinous. There are, in and about the church, old tombs of the Nugents and Cusacks dated 1615, 1625, and 1629. And in the ruined portion, there is a tomb over the relics of Delamere, the founder, bearing the date of 1306. There is a remarkable echo in the church. The bishop, Father Colla, and I amused ourselves in awakening its responses. So by putting my, my body over the path that the altar places in memory, I grow closer to the perceptive movements of the landscape captured by him. In this way, the bodily and investigative possibility of research create, creates a new image. Here uh, is the image captured by, with my cell phone camera by my reflexive body crossing the path he told he had traveled. And I believe the field of presence created inside him by the landscape world he lived there moved him to write about what he experiences there. Could I, after putting my body inside the research, reach something that I could not see before? I believe so.
When the boat passed the old castle of Ballycoen, I felt an interesting revival of some youthful memories. I had often, when a child, read the inscriptions over the entrance. This house was built by, uh, by Sir Jasper Herbert and Dame Mary Fingless in the year 1626. Uh, under the arms pally of the knight and dame had been the motto, by God of might, I hold my right. Here is something uh, interesting. This landscape will remember of youthful memories. And then, the journal brings the impression that the author sees the landscape from a 200 meter distance, since he is boating through a channel, a river that borders the building. The author's vision for what he see in the landscape, the castle ruins between the trees seen from the point of view of the boat of, on the river, leads him to a stroll he once took with his father through the castle ruins. The encounter from the crossing of the reflexive body as a child complementary to the adult one in 1842 appears to contain another experience what other layers and new visions of the castle ruin. So again, here I show you the researcher point of view conducted by her reflexive body crossing the part of the land the author had crossed. On the right side image, you have the phenomenological reflexive body lived by the researcher captured by lens of the photographer. The landscape world repercusses its sensitive in the body of the author, as well as the same landscape world in another time repercusses its sensitivity in the body of the researcher. And so the landscape world connects connect us. And I have access to a crack of sensitivities. I see something between which I had not seen prior. Julian, I'm sorry to say we have to control time, okay? So Okay, it's over. Uh, just the, the last one, the last story. Uh, okay, uh, here uh, is the landscape world living and creating field of presence inside the researcher. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to interrupt at the end. It's always a, a really big challenge to control our time, communication. So no worries, Giselle, it's all right. Yes. Sometimes reading English, it's a little bit slow, slowly for me. And yeah. Okay, so now we have. Um, we, we finally reach Victoria Barbosa de Castro Cunha, uh, representing her group, right? Victoria, you are a big group there, writing the paper, Narratives of Ireland, in the words of contemporary Brazilian I, um, immigrant women. And Victoria is um, a student uh, of business administration, the Federal University of Technology in Paraná. Uh, she's a postgraduate student in translation in English at the Stasi University, and she's also an undergraduate student in management. Uh, her research themes inc include uh, immigrant entrepreneurship, female entrepreneurship, migration studies, and cultural translation since last year. So welcome, Victoria. You have the word. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. Good morning, everyone. Um, my apologies, I won't be sharing my screen because I'll deliver my speech um, without any presentation today. Um, so my paper is about migration and especially women migration to Ireland, which is a process that has been intensified um, um, along the, the last years and involves a major process in which um, people are seeking for better opportunities in another countries. And also because of the refugee situation that affects uh, global matter matters everywhere. 
So according to the international migration stock 2020, 53% of all migra migration movements are um, concerning or involving um, women. And this phenomenon of feminization and migratory, migratory dynamics has become relevant in academia because we are trying to map and understand how these female migrations affect other issues related to um, women insertion in a foreign culture and, and country, um, especially relating to processes of rape or gender issues that affect their insertion in the global market and other uh, more sensitive aspects um, as well, um, like xenophobia or racism and sexism that intersects with all these um, matters of exclusion and domination uh, regarding uh, migration to another country. So women for a long time have been presented as a passive dependence, limiting themselves to following their husbands in these migratory movements. So they have been uh, described as major companions or family members who must be integrated into society um, by the help of these um, companions or these, or these members of the family. Autonomous female migrations uh, though have been expanding and because of that, women migrate alone or accompanied by their children which affect, uh, which impact in other issues to their uh, quality of life and, um, and, and lifestyle in the, the country of destination. In general, these women come out of their countries due to lack of opportunities, as, as I said before, but also to violence or oppression in their own family background or even because of um, community, um, uh, um, how could I say it? Um, community, um, when they feel they don't have uh, enough um, attachments to the local community in their home countries. So they seek the migratory movement in a way to emancipate themselves or even to fulfill um, uh, social and economic dreams. Um, regarding that, um, we also um, try to talk about gender processes involving female migrations, uh, which are imbued by uneven and legitimizing conceptions of power, of actions aimed at ensuring the continuity of a patriarchal system. So in the context of a patriarchy, a paternalistic ideology is crucial because it disarms gender resistance to inequality by subtly shaping perceptions of what women's social roles are and should be. So in other words, paternalistic belief systems provide the proverbial honey that is used to attract disadvantaged people. Groups, um, there are uh, accepted in the foreign country due to subordination and not because they have a social integration in a proper sense. Uh, our theoretical background is uh, grounded in cultural translation. So we base ourselves in, um, in the translation, in the cultural turn within translation studies to understand how these processes of um, translation between cultures affect uh, these women's integration in the Irish society. Regarding that, we try to um, base ourselves in the idea that translation is a kind of manipulation of a source text, of a source text. And in the context of culture, it is a manipulation and a sort of negotiation between cultures and in this sense, uh, the receiving system um, needs to adapt or be receptive to the, the 
the foreign system in which these women come from their countries. For Basse and Le Fever, and the cultural term meant to meant the abandonment of the search of equivalences that occurred in more linguistic and scientific approach to the translation craft, to the detriment of the culture mediated by the materiali materiality of the text, which gained new contours um, in a post-colonial vision and a feminist discourse. So basically, um, trans cultural translation is, is more uh, related to the rewriting and manipulation and carried out at the surface of power and ideology um, regarding one culture to another. And this concept uh, will help us uh, introduce new concepts relating to gender processes in the um, adaptation of these women in in Ireland. Um, let me just continue. Um, in this sense, culture materializes as a language and translation enables linguistic cultural exchange between diverse peoples and social groups. The linguistic blocks that underpin a given culture is important uh, via translation, and this in turn is practiced in such a way as to represent the peculiarities and cultural implicities of, of um, the nationals and also the foreigners. Um, there was a point in which uh, cultural translation also inherited some concepts from social anthropologies, and because of that, we could understand that an ethnographic and methodology could be useful to the to to answer our research question, which was to understand the the new processes, uh, the new the the adaptation process that uh, related to the insertion of these women in the foreign country. So. Our object of study is this process of adaptation um, uh, from a Brazilian culture to Irish culture. And uh, in a post-colonial perspective, that enables us to understand this translation movement, this linguistic and culture translation movement um, and as a negotiation process. Um, let me just move on. Um, our, our major author, uh, a theoretical overview uh, regarding the translation, the cultural translation is Baba. And um, let me just. Uh, in, in today's post colonial cultures, both the ancient. Um, um, we, we try to, to insert this view that former colonies um, bring these ancient symbols and uh, they need to be uh, revealed in a process of hybridism, of culture hybridism, and must therefore be resignified or translated as new signs um, by these uh, populations that have involve a multiplicity of contexts and systems of cultural values. They are um, co-participating co and juxtaposing in the hybrid constitution of post-colonial cultures. Mm. So um, let me just, oh yeah, we also uh, bring this concept, this important concept of translatability that implies that translation of the otherness without subsuming uh, it into preconceived notions. Um, that is, uh, that comes from the post-colonial vision of uh, uh, cultural translation and presents the act of translation in a foreign culture is not simply um, the reframing of reference, but on the contrary is the framework itself in which the subject needs to change 
um, to suit uh, to another uh, to another world. Um, let me just move on to our methodology. So our methodology involved uh, the collection of 75 blog posts um, uh, that were written by 12 uh, women uh, located in, in Ireland. And this uh, total corpus uh, was then pre-analyzed and we and selected in the thematic categorization um, regarding cultural and geographic spatial aspects um, in their adaptation, in the process of their adaptation to the, the, the foreign country, to the foreign culture, sorry. And so uh, some of the, the words that we, the key words we selected was, were gastronomy, uh, language peculiarities, festive dates, local customs, and a subjective representation of Ireland itself. Um, it, it, these data was then analyzed in, in, uh, in regarding narrative analysis. So we brought Bartol, 1976, as a, a major scholar who wrote about life narrative as um, a method for researching narratives and comparing these perceptions of the same reality to apprehend their similarities and differences and comparing the social dimension in a comparative approach um, that implies investigating how a group of people who are in a given social situation deals with that situation. Uh, in this sense, a narrative uh, life narratives provide a subject that tells another whether he or she is the researcher or not. In this case, we did an interview, uh, no one of these women, but we uh, collected uh, episodic narratives of their life experiences that were available online. And this discursive production of the subject um, is um, deemed as a narrative form that is passive to analysis um, in the understanding that uh, social, there is a social dimension in, on them, in them. So um, there is a, not a mere discursive account that takes the narrative form, but an exercise to make oneself known to the other, which implies for the subject um, who tells to seek in memory uh, and reminiscence, providing, however, the possibility um, that makes them, sorry, I, 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 I got lost in my speech. Um, oh, I wanted to say that we also used Alves and Blickstein uh, for the narrative analysis. So uh, they bring in a perspective, they use a semiotic linguistic inquiry of the various voices uh, in a polyphonic discourse and its uh, implicit levels of meaning. So we try to, to understand that in a semiotic linguistic perspective um, and try to decode the many levels um, like the surface plane, uh, the, the intertextual plane and other levels of uh, meaning. Uh, we try to investigate the referential illusion, um, which is meant by people who often spoke of something they were trying to say, which were not actually what they are talking about in this speech. So there was a kind of referential illusion in which they refer to something, but in reality, they wanted to say something else. Um, the recurrence of adverbs, adjectives, and superlative expressions are also analyzed in this kind of approach. And there is a semiotic steps in which we identify semantic axes, which are called by these authors as isotopias. Um, in essence, what our study um, 
found out was that we could notice uh, there was a tendency for these women to highlight aspects of, so, of local culture that were often covered by the mainstream media, like Irish music, Irish weather, Irish ports. And in many, um, in many times of the narrative, these women uh, refer to historic or uh, symbolic figures in Irish history, like powerful women, uh, which, we, uh, uh, which they try to resemble to being in the foreign country. But these were all elements that had little impact on their ordinary life. In fact, their narrative regarding aspects of their uh, everyday life, such as family status or even legal matters, uh, citizenship status, uh, clothing and family issues regarding or even health issues regarding their adaptation in the country um, uh, suggested that these Brazilian women, women faced processes of domination and they no longer enjoyed fundamental rights related to the customs of their homeland, such as the right to give birth by surgery, to have access to um, um, free um, uh, health um, appointments, uh, to enroll their children in co-ed schools, or to use um, um, medicines related to con uh, contraceptual matters without a doctor's prescription, uh, to enter yeah. labor markets. I have to remind yes. you, we have to close now. So okay. Finish, it's it's in the end sorry uh, to enter labor markets segmented by gender relations and this provokes new reflections about the translation process which instead of occurring in a way that allows a negotiation of signs and meanings ends up incurring in the complete absorption of the foreign culture um, and reinforce um, a colonial perspective regarding the migration of women Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now I think we have some time to some time for questions, discussion. Um, let me see if there's any anything in our YouTube. Uh, just uh, Bela Lúcia Silva Souza's comment to Juliana. Uh, top notch, Juliana. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if the panel, the, no, no questions in our chat either, or colleagues in the panel, do you want to make, do you want to ask each other questions? Or I can start, but um, also um, giving you a chance to start if you like. Um, I have questions, but I feel you can start. Exactly. Okay, Isabella, I'll start with you then. Uh, I was delighted with the fact you're studying uh, Colin McCann's uh, narrative, uh, which made me go back to William Butler Yeats's famous line, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, and the deconstruction of that line. So maybe you want to comment a bit on that. Uh, because that's the core, actually, of your paper, right? So I went back to Yeats's line uh, when he writes that in the end, or in the middle of the almost uh, 1916, almost two years before the end of the First World War. Uh, and then Chinua Shabby's uh, book. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Line. So maybe you want to come to that, please. Yeah, no, I, I love this line. Uh, I think... Uh, half of my dissertation is just about this. Uh, things don't fall apart. Um, but yeah, so one thing that is interesting is that McCann actually participated in the homage to the African author that has a book called uh, Things Fall Apart, um, which is a very interesting. I haven't read it, but um, it's, uh, it's very telling that this is a line that describes the, the photograph in the book in Let the Great Words In. And in Things Don't Fall Apart, uh, Shunan Achibi, I never know how to pronounce, he's also talking about uh, 
transcultural and postcolonial relationships with um, with the in Africa in specifically, but uh, in a general context. In my camp, I was a speaker in this uh, in his homage. He, so he has contact. It's with this uh, and also appears in the Yates uh, quote. Uh, and I feel like this is a very telling about what he's trying to do in the book. You know, um, we are talking about the fall of the, the, uh, the fall, the literal fall of the World Trade Center in a time uh, where it didn't happen yet. Uh, but still, there's all these uh, points that connect um, that connects to the present, uh, to this moment. The war, the petite crossing of the towers, the American, you know, the American or warfare in a general sense. And I feel that much of the book is about us and hoping for the things to fall apart so we can feel unity, we can feel connection with the other through this pain that we suffer. A lot of the characters, so, uh, you know, has this bounding through, uh, through their trauma. But the thing that is really going to connect us is the sense of hope that comes from living life after the, the accident um, and understanding that tragic things happen, then then we move on, then we continue. Yeah. Thank you, Isabella. I've, I've just been told here in the chat that we have to finish. I thought we had some time for discussion. Oh, sorry. But, uh, it seems like we have no time for discussion. And I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't want to talk. Sorry. No, no, no. I am sorry because I, I was really counting on a 15 minute time for, for our discussion. I think looking at the program, I thought we would have discussion to, uh, you know, from, uh, but maybe I got mixed up here with the program. So I really apologize. I put in the, in the dialogue here in our chat my email. I'd love to continue talking to you. So if you can email me, I'll write you back. <laughs> oh, yes. And no. You can talk was... to me on something. Yes, no, I was very interested in Juliana's paper too. Uh, the, the thing of going there and walking the path is also very interesting. So I'm so sorry not to listen to you. Mark. Why don't we exchange? Okay, let's exchange our emails in chat and then we continue because we've been told we have to finish. Thank you all. Thank <laughs> See you. you around. Thank you.